1859, literary genius Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities. And for generations, this has been required reading in schools all across the United States. The story talks about the duality that, that exists and takes place specifically in France and England. As I began to write my dissertation, the title of that book resounded through me. You see, as I poured over the social economic data that plagues our communities of need, I thought about a line in the novel. It was the season of darkness. It was the season of light. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. A modern tale of two cities emerged. Consider Flower Mound, Texas, with the lowest level of poverty in the United States, and Camden, New Jersey, with the highest level of poverty in the United States. Did you know that in 2014, Flower Mound, Texas, was cited as one of the wealthiest cities in the United States? I mean, honestly. Did you know that Flower Mound, Texas even existed? <laughs> well, as I considered the data, these cities depict the social economic difference that plagues our communities of need. Consider for a moment with me, Flower Mound, Texas, poverty level in 2014, 2.4%. Camden, New Jersey, 42.6%. As I dug deeper, I recognized the relationship between poverty levels and levels of higher education. Flower Mound, Texas, 97.1%. Camden, New Jersey, 67.5%. I also noticed that there were higher levels of poverty and there were higher levels of crime. But what was most startling to me was the relationship between higher levels of poverty and the number of teenage pregnancies. In 2014 in Flower Mound, Texas, it was reported to have 28 pregnancies or births to teenage mothers. In Camden, New Jersey, 342. I would say that these statistics paint a picture of the mood within these cities. One is the spring of hope, and the other is certainly the winter of despair. Could this be why in 2014 there were 121 new businesses in Flower Mound, Texas? In Camden, New Jersey, only six. The number of Americans living in poverty today, 39.7 million Americans. Women and children represent over 70% of those impoverished. One in three single mother households live in poverty. And those numbers among people of color are even greater. As I thought about these cities, I thought about the girls in these cities. Fundamentally, girls across the United States, regardless of their zip codes, share common characteristics. In their hearts, they ask themselves three questions. One, am I pretty enough? Two, will I fit in? And three, will I have somebody to love? The number of girls living in poverty across the United States grows every day. There are external forces, such as social media and peer pressure, that warp their self-being, bringing about burdens that take away their abilities to dream. We must build a society that returns their power to them their power lies in their self-knowing. 
We must change the mindsets of little girls to transform communities of poverty into communities of prosperity. We must build the confidence and the faith in little girls between the ages of 10 to 14 to believe in the sounds of their own voices, to bring their dreams out of hiding, and to believe that their dreams can come true. Psychiatrist Carl Jung said it best. Our ability to have vision lies within our ability to look deep into our own hearts. He who looks outside dreams. He who looks inside awakens. I was that little girl with a dream, born in a world in turmoil right after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I was born to a girl who was, who was raised in public housing, one of 10 children. You know, in my opinion, my mother was a hometown hero. She graduated early at the tender age of 16, valedictorian of her class, and received a full ride to an Ivy League university and studied math, no less. When she became a sophomore, she also became a mother. So decisions had to be made and had to be made uh, quickly. My grandmother agreed to take me on and raise me as her own as my mother continued her education. She graduated from University of Pennsylvania, went on to NYU Law School, and then returned home to begin a successful career in corporate America. You know, those lessons early in my life as I watched my mother, those lessons of sacrifice, of the ability to delay gratification, of the ability to budget, and have self-discipline. That left a mark on me. I can tell you so many stories, but I'll tell you this one. My mother would often set goals, and I remember that she was planning to pay for my college education. And so, at least in my little girl's mind, it felt like months that she said, we're gonna sacrifice, we're not eating out, we're gonna have discipline. And we didn't eat out, no, no, no. We didn't even eat a lot of variety. We ate spinach. We had spinach soup, spinach salad, spinach casserole, it was spinach everywhere. But also, what was there? I saw the money growing. I saw my mother reach this goal. Those lessons of discipline would follow me throughout life, follow me throughout my college career, working on my master's, beginning my career in corporate America, and then 13 years ago, it really came into play when I started my company, Artix. Artix is a healthcare management and consulting firm. At our prime, we've had 140 employees all across the United States working on important legislation like Medicare Part C, Medicare Part D, and the Affordable Care Act. I was working hard, pleasing my customers in those early years. My head was down, and I looked up all of a sudden, and I had over 100 employees. And I said, what am I supposed to do with all these people? And so I knew to do what I do best, I went back to school. I went to Oklahoma State University. And I remember those first weeks in the program. Our professors stood before us and they said, your job as a PhD candidate is to close the gap in the literature. Now, I don't know how many of you have worked on your PhD. But every day, you're reading journal articles, what felt like 100 pages a day, 150 pages a day, 50 journal articles a day. And I remember thinking to myself, how could there possibly be a gap in the literature? I mean, there's so many words. I don't think there's any other words anyone else can write. Until a light bulb went off. I don't see my story 
nor the story of millions of girls across this United States represented in the literature. And so I went to my advisor who became my dissertation committee chair and I expressed my interest. What he would show me would change my life from that moment on. He turned me on to a theory by Erickson called expert performance. Then he talked to me about a deliberate practice. In deliberate practice, there's eight components, but one of those components is that it takes 10,000 hours and you can become an expert. I then read an article by Barron and Henry, which spoke about deliberate practice in the context of entrepreneurship, and I fell in love. I decided that I would replicate my life. I would go across the United States, and I would, look, I would work with girls who live in poverty, introduce them to entrepreneurship, and change their world forever. And so that became my study, and Envision, Lead, Grow was born. Barron and Henry speaks to cognitive resources being a major component of entrepreneurship and that by demonstrating experiential learning and vicarious learning, that can substitute for experience as an entrepreneur. And so in 2017, I went on the road and I collected data from 414 girls in seven states across the United States. I introduced them to entrepreneurship through Envision League Grow, which is a four-pronged program. The first prom, it is a one-week immersion camp where the girls come from all over the United States and they learn to be an entrepreneur in one week. The second part of the program, when they return to their homes, they're placed into groups of three and they receive a mentor. This is a female entrepreneur or successful woman who says, I want to pour into girls in my community. And they usher them through the program for an entire year. The third part of the program, we extend the classroom to a virtual setting, and the girls continue in the program monthly by hearing additional curriculum from our eight seeds of success. And the fourth part of the program is an important part that all entrepreneurs understand, and that is, no risk, no reward. The girls who give the most, the girls who are most engaged, they receive their reward by having an all expense paid trip to Washington DC for our Entrepreneur Institute. During those two and a half days, the girls receive training from eight Fortune 500 female executives and eight successful entrepreneurs. On the third day of the program, we open the doors to the public, and the girls are set up, and they sell their products, goods, and services. They look adults in the eye, and they say, hello, my name is Susie, and I'm president and CEO of XYZ. We're three years in now, and the proof is in the pudding. I want to introduce you to one of our girl bosses, Azaria. Azaria from Norfolk, Virginia. Azaria is born to a single mother. She was in a Title I school, but she had a love for science. When Azaria came to us in the first year, three years ago, she said that she suffered from bullying and had anxiety because she loved science and science wasn't considered cool. But she knew what she loved, and she wanted to share that with the world. And so we tell the girls, bring a pain or a problem, help find a solution, and there lies your success as an entrepreneur. So she formed a nonprofit, Zinc Girls Inc., where she works with inner city girls to teach them STEM lessons. The second year, Azaria returned. And she recognized a hard lesson that many nonprofits recognize. 
You need money to run a nonprofit. <laughs> and so she decided, okay, well, I'm going to form a for-profit, and I'm going to sell products with positive affirmations. And when I get money from those products, I am going to fund my dream. And so she formed Pretty Girl Tees. Azaria is wildly successful. Every time I tell this story, I plant seeds of success into these little girls' minds. And I'm moving them from asking those questions that little girls ask to having powerful answers. Answer number one, my thoughts are worthy for the world to hear. Answer number two, I am a contributor to this world. And answer number three, oh yes, I'm worthy to be loved. And I'm worthy to give love <clears throat> because I am of service to my community. <clears throat> These girls, yes, this program has been a gift to them. The program, honestly, has been a gift to the little girl in me. The little girl who suppressed the feeling of rejection by not having her mother nor her father in her life in those early years. The toddler who would search for her mother's face in the sea of faces that attempted to fill in the gap. The tween girl who used accomplishments as a method to make her mother feel that it was worth returning home and building a family with her. The teenager who felt isolated as she returned home every day after school to an empty house while her mother worked up the corporate ladder the young adult who would go off to James and Madison University and find her voice on the hills of Madison, the young woman who would find her soulmate, her passion, and raise a family, the woman who was a conqueror and showed little girls that, yes, you can dream. Well, the first stop that we made that first year. Memphis, Tennessee. I still remember we walked into the classroom and there was a bulletin board. On that bulletin board, there was a post-it note. And on that post-it note, there was a message. Someone had written, little girls who dream become women with vision. Oh, that would become the Envision League World mantra. And I know that it's true because this little girl overcame obstacles, believed in her dream, and awoke to stare 1,000 girls across the United States to believe that their dreams can come true also. Thank you so much.